today songs of praise and worship through praying to him through just being the church together and it's just great to see everyone here so in that vein i'm going to start by praying and i guess in the busyness of whatever your days have looked like i'll just give you some time to, to just stop to breathe and to reflect on god's goodness uh, before i pray so let's do that now Let's pray. Father God, we come to you this afternoon to praise you and to worship you and to thank you for who you are and what you've done for us. Um, thank you that you are with us right now uh, by your spirit. And Lord, thank you for these words uh, from Romans 11 that tell us about who you are. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has given, been his counsellor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Uh, we're going to pray this prayer together as well. The Lord's Prayer, which is going to appear on the screen. And uh, as we do this, let's do this with the knowledge. This is what Jesus taught us to pray. Uh, and it reminds us of who God is as well. So let's say these words. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours forever and ever. Amen. Amen. We're going to stand and we're going to sing a song of worship to God. It's come, praise, and glorify. So let's, uh, let's sing together. Thank you.
something in particular I think really gets across um, why we're here. And we're here to worship and glorify God because he's worthy of praise because of his mercy to us that he didn't give us punishment for the sins we deserved. Um, through his son he took that punishment away and instead gave us something we don't deserve which is to be adopted as his sons and daughters and to enjoy that relationship uh, forever which is an incredible thing. And if you're anything like me you spend your week sometimes aware of that and sometimes not as aware of that as we should be. Um, and even though we've been forgiven of our sin and ransomed and redeemed and all of those amazing things, it's easy to, to sometimes live from day to day actually sinning and doing wrong things. So for, for times like that, it's good to confess our sin to God and to ask for forgiveness. Um, because as we await the bringing about of the new heaven and the new earth and we're given new bodies, um, when we worship God face to face, we will mess up and we will get things wrong. So we're going to say these words together, which will hopefully appear on the screen. Um, and these are right from Psalm 51. These are words that David himself prayed when he messed up and got things wrong. So let's, um, let's say these words together. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and turn from all wickedness. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us, renew a right spirit in us, and restore us to the joy of your salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. So for our uh, kids thought today, it kind of seemed rude not to talk about Mothering Sunday, because it's Mothering Sunday today. Um, who got their mum like a really nice present today? Can you put your hand up? Uh, well, pretty much everyone. Well, there should be more hands. Well, that's fine, that's fine. Um, so I, got, I thought I'd just mention to you because I, I feel like I need some sort of, um, you know, recognition of how good uh, my present was this year. Um, so I got my mum a book, a book that I'd read that I thought was really good. Um, and you might think that's, that's okay, but I also got a gift wrapped as well. So um, I clicked the function on Amazon where you pay another four pounds to gift wrap it. Um, and when my mum said thank you for the thank you for the book, she even mentioned gift wrapping. So if you want to bear that in mind for next year, uh, if, if you don't know how to do that, um, you can do it on Amazon. So yeah, follow my example there. Um, on that, uh, Mother's Day is just a great opportunity to, to say thank you um, for the mothers, uh, our mothers that you that you have, and also the, the mother-like figures in our lives as well, those people that have in some way nurtured you or helped you um, in whatever way you can think of. And um, I was reading through the Bible and actually I found that God really understands this idea of being nurtured and looked after and protected in the same way a mother does with a child. Because Jesus says in Luke 13, 34, he says, how often have I wanted, and he's talking to Jerusalem here, so the people that he loves so much. He says, how often I've wanted to gather your children together as a hen protects her chicks beneath her wings, but you wouldn't let me. So Jesus says, actually, like a mother hen, I want to look after you and protect you and make sure everything's all right, which is a really amazing thing. So when we celebrate mothers, when we celebrate mother-like figures in our lives, we can remind ourselves that God wants to take care of us too. Um, so I'd encourage you to do that this Mother's Day and every other Mother's Day. Since I read that verse, I found it really, really helpful to think about God as well. Um, and this is a brilliant Mother's Day as well, because um, Sarah just had her baby, which is really exciting. I assume Sarah's at the back of the church somewhere, probably tending to her baby. Yeah, so Sarah, congratulations to you and Ed. Um, yeah, we'll do that. Amazing. Um, yes, I can't see her, but I know she's there. Um, what amazing news. So baby Isaac, we're just thrilled that he'll be a part of our church family, and we'll be praying for Sarah and Ed and Isla and Isaac as well. And we'll be praying for Abby. Um, where is Abby? Abby's here. There, I can see her hand as well. Um, as she heads into like, yeah, the later stages of pregnancy too. So what a, what a day to celebrate Mother's Day. Um, now I'm going to pray for them in a little bit. Um, but I also want to just acknowledge that Mother's Day, while it's a great day for, for lots of us, it can also be a difficult day in you know, a multitude of different ways. I just think it's worth acknowledging that. Um, and that we worship a God who understands pain as well. Um, and on that, I thought I'd show this video that really helps us understand how uh, even, 
even though we might not all be mothers, even though um, we are all in different situations with that, the Bible shows us there are loads of different ways to celebrate um, the women in our lives. So we'll watch that now. Thank you. Happy Mother's Day, Sarah. After waiting to have a child for so many years, you must be overjoyed to have Isaac. Today is about you and all those who are still waiting. Happy Mother's Day, midwives of Israel. You risk your own safety to ensure the survival of countless children. Today is about you and all those who care for children and call it work. Happy Mother's Day, daughter of Pharaoh. By welcoming Moses and your family, you showed so much love. Today is about you and all foster and adoptive parents. Happy Mother's Day, Naomi. You walked with Ruth as a friend and cared for a child as your own grandchild. Today is about you and all grandmothers and extended family who care for children. Happy Mother's Day, Hannah. You let go of Samuel, even though it hurt you. Today is about you and all those whose children are not living with them right now. Happy Mother's Day, Ellen. Life didn't go as you had hoped, yet you found peace and worth in your service to God. Today is about you and all those experiencing heartache at how things have turned out. Happy Mother's Day, Lois and Eunice. Your faith changed Genesis' life. Today is about all those who are playing a part in raising the next generation. Mother's Day is about you, whatever your role might be. Thank you. Um, great video. Shall we just pray together? Uh, Father, thank you that when we trust in Jesus, you become our Father, and that is an incredible thing. Um, and thank you that you care for us in the same way a mother hen is just so protective of, of the chicks that are under her wings as they walk into dangerous situations and they walk into the big wide world. Um, we praise you for that, that you love us that much. And Lord, we praise you as well for, for Mothering Sunday, for, for the mothers and for those who are, are like mothers to many of us. Um, we worship you for the people that you put in our lives and we appreciate their goodness uh, in so many different ways. Father, for those today who are struggling um, or just don't look forward to this day, thank you that you draw close to them, um, that you know what pain is like. Um, you yourself, Father, lost your son um, and you feel that. Um, thank you that you are with us uh, in, in every emotion uh, and that Jesus himself has walked on this earth and, and we can't say that about anyone else uh, that we worship. Um, and Lord, we just thank you when we worship you for um, the safe delivery of Isaac, um, we pray for that family. We pray for Sarah and Ed and Isla as they welcome this new baby into their family. Um, it's just really good news, and we thank you for it. Um, please help them to, to continue to raise their child, uh, and for the extended family as well. We pray for them too. Uh, and Lord, we pray for Abby and John as, as they continue on this process. Uh, for them as a family, I pray that yeah, the baby would arrive safely as they go into this um, last period of that too. We give you worship, God, and we give you thanks. Amen. 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 Uh, we're going to stand and we're going to sing uh, a song about Jesus uh, and about how Jesus is both strong and also kind. So let's sing and, and sing together.
seats everyone thank you um, many kids and younger kids it's time for you to go upstairs um, but I'm going to pray for you first so don't go just yet um, let's pray for, for many kids and younger kids and for older kids a bit later as well but well, thank you that your words bring life and we pray that as many kids and younger kids and older kids a little bit later head off um, that you will be with them be with their leaders help them to understand how the Bible really does change us and impact every area of our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Many kids and younger kids, you can go. Um, and while they go, everyone else, you can chat to each other for a bit. Grab someone you haven't met before, maybe, and talk about stuff. <laughs> Okay, thank you everyone. Brings their conversations to an end, um, which you continue continue after the service. Um, great. We're going to take a look at some notices of the exciting things that are going on in church this week. Um, so tomorrow evening, Impact is going to be on for the usual place, at the usual time. So if you're primary school age, or is it? I think it's year three to six actually, or year two, year three to six. three to six. If you're in those years, then please come along. Really good to see you. Uh, Salt's going to be slightly different this week, so we're going to have a, a social at Jez and Poppy's house from 6.30 to 8. Um, if you don't know what that is, um, you can ask Jez and Poppy, or you can go on like the, the chat that we've got going, or Elijah, you can ask Elijah too. Is that, where is it? Is it your house? <laughs> is it your parents' names? <laughs> uh, community group's going to be happening, like as per usual. And then I've got, I think it's on the next slide actually. Yeah, so you see use at Water Park and Oak Hall, so go to those if you go to those schools. Um, and then I think the thing that is really exciting in the coming two weeks are the Passion for Life events that are going to be running. 
So Cookfield Baptist Church on the evening of the 1st of April um, is going to be a really good event um, with a really great speaker, and there should be flyers dotted around the chairs for that. And then evening of the 8th of April, Line of Judah concert at Haywood's Heath College. So if you're like a young person, it's really aimed for young, younger people, I guess, and you can bring your friends, and yeah, I'm speaking at that. So pray for me. Um, we really appreciate your friends for that. Last thing is Solid Bible Club, which is the 12th to the 14th of April. Um, if you're primary school aged, we'd love for you to sign up to that. I um, appreciate lots of people are away though. And if you're of SALT age, it'd be great to have your help. So if you'd like to, to join and help in, we've got lots of jobs you can do. Um, so let us know about that. Um, I think that's it for notices. I'm going to hand over to Poppy, who's going to interview Gina. Thank you. Everyone. I'm Gina. <laughs> um, Gina and Tom are in our community group and it's been such a blessing to get to know you guys over the last few months. Um, we're going to find a little bit more about Gina today. Gina, can you tell us what you do as your job? <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I work for a Christian publishing company um, called Reformation Lightning and we're like a really new company, so almost a year old, and we've got about six uh, books out at the moment. Um, and I am the assistant editor. Uh, so basically, I just I kind of do everything because it's such a small company. Um, yeah, overseeing books from like uh, conception all the way through to publication. Um, but yeah, we're basically for, for children's fiction. Um, so middle grade, age seven, um, through to young adult, like eighteen. Yeah. I can see the books there, actually. <laughs> I'll bring them out in a minute. <laughs> um, that sounds like the kind of job I would like to do. <laughs> can you tell us why you're so passionate about um, publishing and children's literature, if you are? <laughs> yeah, I'm so passionate. Um, when I saw the job, I was like, I was just looking for any job I could do alongside my counselling. Um, and then I saw this job, and it was only eight hours a week, but I thought I had to go for it because it combines like my two favorite things, which is Jesus and books. So, um, but I'm not just passionate for that reason. Um, I just think story is is just so powerful. Um, it kind of gets truth uh, into people's lives in a really different way. Um, C.S. Lewis says it so well, like so much better than I could, but he, he talks about how people have these like barriers to like Christian truth. So like in addition, um, so like when you hear the word church and Jesus and the Bible, sometimes you just close off. Um, but story is like a way of bypassing that, um, which you can see in his Narnia series. So that's that's definitely our vision as well. Yeah. And yeah, I've got two books here actually that um, Gina very kindly lent to Elijah to get him through his isolation this week. I think he read them in about a day, um, and he really enjoyed them, didn't you? Do you want to say anything about the books or um, yeah. yeah. So I'll, I'll give them to you. Oh, I can give them. Yeah, go on then. Yeah. These are just um, two books. So they're kind of, they're both um, fantasy actually, part of the series um, by two different authors. So yeah, there will be two more for each of these coming out. Um, but yeah, you can read them, you can borrow them off me um, or just buy them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Probably better to buy them. <laughs> um, so, Gina, how can we, as a church, support you in your role? Um, support, yeah. As a, a thing, we need so much support because um, we're really, really new and we have like big visions, but um, it is just very small at the moment. So, any cheerleaders, um, you know, on social media or on our email list would be really good. But other than that, just prayer, really, I think. Mm. Yeah. Um, so what can we say to you? <laughs> um, yeah, I think prayer that because um, we're building something and we want it to be of God, like we don't want to just it, it to just be a human thing, um, but we do want it to impact people as well. We want the books to really impact us and just bring that truth home in a new way. So prayer for that would be really good. Um, prayer for me would be good because it is quite demanding um, now that it's it's a lot more than eight hours, three days a week now. I don't know if I said that, but yeah. Alongside my counselling, which is also quite demanding, so that would be good. Um, what's your 
Reformation Lightning. Reformation Lightning. Cool. Okay, let me pray for you. <coughs> Father God, I thank you so much for this Christian publishing company, Reformation Lightning. Lord, I just thank you so much for the gifts that you give people to write excellent literature. Lord, personally, as a mother, I just feel like there is so much need for pure and godly Christian literature for children at this time. And so I just really thank you for this company and the people behind it. Lord, we just really pray, especially for Gina in her role, Lord, there. Um, help her to find time to do all the stuff that she needs to do, Lord. Help her to do good work, Lord. Um, and yeah, we just really pray that this company would grow and flourish, Lord. Um, and yeah, be a real, be a real breath, blessing to the church, but also to, to our nation, to, to the children of this nation, Lord, that it might be a way of them getting interested in hearing the truth, Lord Jesus. Pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thanks, Poppy. Thanks, Gina. Um, we're going to spend some time worshiping God in song. Um, so, worship group, you can come up. We're going to sing two uh, brilliant songs that just take us to Jesus, really. Uh, Living Hope um, and All I Have is Christ. So, we're going to stand and sing these. Um, after the songs, um, we'll have a time of, of like response. Um, before Luke leads us in prayer. Thank you.
Christ's life. Father, thank you that our hope is in Jesus. It's not some airy fairy thing, but it's based on him. It's eternal life, his resurrection, all that he has done for us. Thank you that when we look at ourselves, we see nothing. We look at him and see our solid hope in which to build our lives and our eternity.
then please um, take your seats. We're going to continue worshiping because uh, Luke's going to lead us in prayer. Thank you, Luke. Before I pray, I'm just going to read a few verses uh, from Psalm 103. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how they were formed. He remembers that we are dust. Father God, thank you so much uh, that we can meet together uh, as your church. Uh, thank you for your um, compassion on us, uh, for us who fear you. Uh, thank you for uh, your mercy and for your grace uh, towards us. Uh, that Jesus um, uh, paid the price, that Jesus paid um, uh, uh, took the punishment uh, that we deserve. Uh, thank you uh, so much for that. Thank you for your love uh, for us um, and for your compassion. Uh, Lord, we don't want to keep this to ourselves. We want other people to realise how awesome you are, how compassionate and great uh, you are. Lord, I ask that you would enable us to uh, reflect on this as we approach Easter. Uh, we rem would remember all that you have achieved uh, for us through your death, and your resurrection. Lord, also for the Passion of Life events, for, for this Friday, for the event with uh, Lion of Judah, that again, we'd be able to invite our friends and that people would see you uh, for who you are uh, and for all uh, that you've done. Father, also thank you that you are so powerful, uh, that nothing is too difficult for you, that you have created um, all things. <clears throat> Father God, thank you so much uh, for baby Isaac, uh, for the joy of him being born uh, this week. Lord, help him um, as he grows up uh, to know you um, and to love you more uh, than anything else. Uh, thank you for Sarah um, and for Ed. Give them uh, the, um, sustain them, uh, enable them to, uh, to do everything they need, even when they're tired. And Lord, also thank you so much um, uh, for Abby. Uh, continue to help her um, and John as they go through the last stage uh, of uh, their pregnancy. Lord, I do pray for their new child as well, that uh, he or she would grow up to know um, and love and serve you. Father, thank you that we can celebrate Mother's Day today. Uh, thank you for um, uh, all of our mothers or people who are uh, mother-like um, uh, towards us. Please continue uh, to bless them, um, uh, to sustain them and equip them in the amazing job uh, that they do uh, for you. Father, as we have prayed, thank you that absolutely nothing is too difficult for you. Um, we, look, we look across the world and we see such pain um, and suffering, things which are so difficult, which we've got no idea um, how we would fix. But Lord, thank you that you know what to do. Um, uh, Lord, for the situation um, in Ukraine, uh, for all of the uh, suffering that's taking place there. Uh, Lord, for the ongoing uh, impact of COVID, especially um, in developing countries. For people who uh, live in poverty, who uh, don't have enough to feed themselves, that don't have shelter and the basic uh, things that we take for granted. Lord, it's hard to imagine what uh, that's like for these people, um, but Lord, provide what they need. Um, help us to be generous um, and to give um, and to help them um, in their struggles. Father, we also pray for people who have um, health issues, um, for Vicky, uh, for Adele, for Claire, uh, for Kaylee. Um, and for others uh, that we're aware of. And Father, as a church, thank you so much that you um, have united us. And please help us to continue to be uh, united as a church. For each one of us to fix our eyes upon you. For us to treasure you more than anything else. For us uh, to love you with all of our hearts, uh, mind, uh, soul and strength. Lord, help us, each of us, to realise how worthy and how awesome you are. Uh, Lord, that we would uh, trust you in whatever circumstances uh, we face. And Lord, also that we would worship you in every sphere um, of our life. Uh, that what we do, uh, what we say, uh, what we think will reflect uh, your beauty um, and your glory. Lord, thank you that you have placed each one of us uh, in our different um, our front lines. Thank you that we could hear about Gina and the work that she does. Thank you that you placed each one of us in our families, in our schools, in our jobs, in our friendship groups. 
And Lord, I do ask that we would shine uh, so brightly for you and wherever you've placed us, that we would be bold uh, to speak of you, that we would live distinct um, and holy lives, and that through that, others would see uh, how amazing you are. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Nick. Um, older kids, you're not going to go upstairs to your, to your group, so um, have a good time. And yeah, head straight upstairs and um, have a great time. Great. Before John uh, comes and preaches, Gavin's going to come and read uh, our Old Testament reading. Thank you, Gavin. I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant who you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness, and the offerings of Judea and Jerusalem will be acceptable to the Lord as in the days gone by, as in former years. So I will come to put you on trial. I will be quick to testify against sorcerers, adulterers, and perjurers, against those who defraud laborers of their wages, who oppress the widows and the fatherless, and deprived foreigners among you of justice. But do not fear me, says the Lord Almighty. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Gavin. Uh, and that was Malachi 3. Did you notice some of the things? A prediction through Malachi that the Lord himself is going to arrive. A messenger is going to come before him that Luke tells us is John the Baptist. And he's going to come refining the Levites who served him. So splitting out those who are faithful from those who are not. Uh, and bringing justice against those who do wrong. Well, it's going to be the backdrop for our New Testament reading. So if you could turn with me to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. And this is the last of our series in Luke 11 and 12. We'll be doing a, a character study next week before we get to Palm Sunday. But Luke chapter 12. And uh, we're going to read in a moment from verse 49 through to 59. Just before we do that, uh, can I just welcome everyone online? Uh, it's great to have you with us. Also to say, uh, really lovely to hear from Gina earlier, um, maybe as an Easter present you could buy one of the books from Reformation Lightning for someone. It's a great gift at Easter, isn't it? A Christian novel that to give to um, uh, someone between seven and older teens. So uh, top tip for Easter. Now let's pray and then we can read God's word and think on it together. Oh, Father, we, we pray again as we come to your word that you give us hearts that are ready to receive what Jesus has to say to us through what he said then, even today. Help us, Lord, to be those who trust him, who take him at his word, who live differently because of it. Help us, Lord, to see through the rather superficial veneer of life to the things of weight that are really real. And help me, Lord, to be faithful in trying to communicate that. We ask it all for Jesus' sake. Amen. Paul, am I loud enough at the back? I feel a bit quiet here. Great. Good. Let's read then from Luke chapter 12 uh, and verse 49. I have come to bring fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to undergo, and what constraint I am under until it is completed. Do you think I came to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but division. From now on, there will be five in one family divided against each other, three against two, and two against three. 
They'll be divided father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. He said to the crowd, when you see a cloud rising in the west, immediately you say it's going to rain and it does. And when the south wind blows, you say it's going to be hot and it is. Hypocrites. You know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and the sky. How is it that you don't know how to interpret this present time? Why don't you judge for yourselves what is right? As you're going to, with your adversary to the magistrate, try hard to be reconciled on the way. Or your adversary may drag you off to the judge and the judge turn you over to the officer and the officer throw you into prison. I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. And so says God's word. Well, do keep it open if you can. And uh, parents, maybe we can make sure kids that are in have got a Bible so they can see it for themselves. Uh, and if you've got a Bible there, we're on, what page are we on in our Bibles, Blue Bibles here? 1046. So if you could turn up 1046, that'd be brilliant. It's just really good to be showing uh, our young ones uh, God's word. And um, kids, it's really good for you to be reading it to check that what I'm saying is what Jesus is saying. Uh, now, look, one of the things that I imagine we might all have considered uh, about the war in the Ukraine is if this happened here, would we Brits be up to it? I don't know about you, I've thought that a number of times. You know, would we have the backbone and the grit that we've seen the Ukrainian people have? It's not hard, is it, to see that we are quite a cosified culture. We're surrounded by luxuries, uh, and as the decades have gone by, that's had its impact on us, hasn't it? We're used to having what we need when we want it. Now, you can just get it delivered to your door. You don't even have to get off your sofa. We can feel we'd rather not go out if going out might mean because we haven't got the car, you know, a 30 minute walk. We're, we're actually a fairly cosified culture. And we see that in all sorts of ways. We see it in being so adverse to pain and struggle that one of the greatest crimes now is to cause offence, to hurt someone's feelings, to make them uncomfortable in some way. And I don't know about you, but if you've been looking at Jesus' teachings over the last couple of months, you wonder how that lands to people like us, who are, if you like, pretty sensitive compared to the rest of history and perhaps the rest of the world. It was right back in 1937, a man called Richard Nieber noted that this cosifying of culture uh, combined with a, a sort of liberal theology that rejects everything in scripture that conflicts with modern ideas, ends up actually changing the gospel. This is what he said, that the church ends up with a God without wrath, who brought men without sin into a kingdom without judgment through the ministrations of a Christ without a cross. In other words, the church, because of its sentimentality, ends up trying to take the teeth out of the line of the tribe of Judah to make it an easy, comfortable gospel, inoffensive. And I have to say, this sort of gospel is still proclaimed for many pulpits, isn't it? Or at the very least, it's assumed that this is what Jesus teaches and not corrected. The Jesus of this gospel is all about affirming everyone. Doesn't matter what response to Jesus they might have, doesn't matter how they live, affirming, affirming, affirming. A Jesus who would never want anyone to be distressed, anyone to ever struggle or feel challenged. But we've seen over these months, haven't we? That's not the true Jesus. That's not the Jesus of history. He's sometimes very, very uncomfortable. We often think, oh, wouldn't it have been lovely to walk around with Jesus? I don't know. I don't think it would have been always very lovely. I think it would have been deeply convicting, uh, very, very unsettling. No, his love is not the shallow, sentimental love of 21st century Western culture. His love is a nuanced love. It's a big picture love that sees things as they actually are. It's a more weighty love, a more real love, a, a love that engages with 
the darkness of the world as it actually is, rather than washing over it and pretending it's not there. And I hope as we end this series in chapters 11 and 12, you started to feel that, perhaps to be unsettled by King Jesus. I know I have. Well, to sum it all up today, Jesus wants to clarify what he is actually about, just so that we're absolutely clear. It's his mission, if you like. And he then wants to urge us on to a right response. So what is Jesus' mission? What has he come to do? Well, I don't know about you, but verse 49 is a surprise, isn't it? What he says he's come to do, he says, I've come to bring fire on the earth and how I wish it were already kindled. It's strong language. Literally, I've come to cast or throw fire down onto the earth. It's almost certainly the language of final judgment because that's how he uses fire elsewhere in the gospel. Chapter 3, verse 17, he talks about um, a, a fire that is unquenchable. And even if you look back to verse 48, you can see that he's got final judgment in mind, hasn't he? He's been talking about punishment in that parable. So Jesus is saying, verse 49, he's come to bring judgment. We saw that in the book of Malachi. The prediction was that a messenger would come and then the Lord himself would arrive to judge. And that is not something for us to be apologetic about and sort of to try and uh, uh, spin in some way it's a really really good thing think if you can of it this way it's commonly known that small forest fires are actually a very good thing a very necessary thing for the forest the reason is that they clear away all the debris that's around on the floor and they open the floor up to the sun so what that means is with all the rubbish burnt up that the stuff that remains the trees they can flourish properly they can thrive and grow well, that's why Jesus, verse 49, is longing for judgment. He hates sin. And he longs for the day when all that is bound up with it will be finally burned up and removed from his kingdom. So that all that remains is going to be free from evil. You know, able to thrive in the way that's originally intended. Uh, Malachi spoke of how the Levites would be refined, the, those who don't want to serve the Lord removed so that the other ones would be purified. So judgment is good, first and foremost, because it removes all wrongdoing. Uh, but second, it's good because it rights all wrongdoing as well. You know, it is about justice. So Jesus can long for it because it is wrong for sin to go unpunished, for victims to think God's unconcerned for the appalling things that have been done to them. This is why God won't just let people off. As he said through Malachi, I will be quick to testify against those who defraud laborers, oppress widows, and act against foreigners. You see, we have to actually recognize that this whole thing about Judgment Day is a really good thing. It's an expression of God's deep, deep love for this world and for those in it. And we know that deep down. We know, don't we, deep down that wrongdoing must be punished. We know that Putin uh, needs to get his just desserts, if not in this life, in the next. But we know that too about the abusive spouse, about the nasty colleague. Well, on Judgment Day, none of us will be able to cry chalk dust at the umpire, you know, like they do in the tennis, when you just won't accept that the ball's out. Now, the replay will show that we are way, way, way past the line. But just when we might feel the terror of that, verse 50, but I have a baptism to undergo, and what constraint I am under until it is completed. They're quite intriguing words, aren't they? Jesus doesn't come just to put the world right through judgment, to bring about a flourishing kingdom. But before that, before that, he's got to do something. And what he's got to do is he's got to act to give us access to his salvation so that we might be saved from the judgment to come. Think about baptism. You know, if you can remember when you were baptized, did you get wet? Yes. Did you get really wet? Well, if we did it, you did. 
you know, he'd be right under the water. Uh, I think it was Paul, he, even with the babies, he likes them to go right down uh, under the water to get absolutely soaked, because that's speaking of something that baptism is about. It's about washing, submerging, immersing. But what is it in verse 50 that this baptism is one that constrains Jesus, the idea of it consumes him in deep distress. What is it that he hasn't yet been submerged in that could cause such anxiety, that could cause him actually to long, verse 49, to be beyond it, to be at that moment of judgment and of uh, uh, the kingdom rid of all evil? What could long Jesus for getting there rather than to this great immersion? It's a cross, isn't it? In fact, in Mark 10, 39, we get that because he uses the same language of baptism when he talks about having to drink the cup of God's wrath, his great anger at all that's gone wrong. When you look at verse 49 and 50, there is a tension in Jesus, isn't there? And it's the tension you find in Gethsemane just before Good Friday. There he longed to be able to skip the cross to what lay beyond. But get this because of his commitment to his father because jesus wants to obey his father fully to bring all honor to him and because he wants you in his kingdom and me in his kingdom he won't skip it you know he's going to go to that cross knowing exactly what it means and as is pictured in baptism there die to sin and come to new life now kids Please hear this, because whenever we talk about the cross, we know you've heard it a lot as you've been growing up, and it's really important to make sure you're really hearing just what it is. What we're seeing here is something of really how excellent, glorious Jesus is, your saviour. This is gritty love, isn't it? This is weighty love, courageous love. Jesus doesn't pull back from the cross because he wants every one of us who are his to be rescued from our sins. That's love, isn't it? Despite it meaning an immersion in the anger of God at sin, Jesus goes straight for it. Handed over to the full force of evil in being betrayed and isolated and mocked and beaten. And then that torturous death uh, but also the spiritual, the psychological anguish, the torment, a hell-like God-forsakenness that he endured for those three hours as he hung there until suffocating to death. Why? Because he loves us. Why else? Ready to be submerged, baptised in all that, so that we could be his. Isaiah 53, 5, he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We can't hear it too much, can we? And if you're not yet a Christian, uh, it's so important to grasp that this is the heart of our faith. Imagine yourself if you can, okay? Try and picture it. You're drowning out at sea, okay? The waves are buffeting you. You can't save yourself. The, the shore is too far to get to. Uh, and there's no point in hanging on to the person next to you because they're drowning as well. You'll just both go down more quickly. So you're desperate. And then you hear that, and the helicopter's coming over from the cliff. Uh, and you see it up above you, and down comes a lifeguard. He's winched down. Uh, and he comes down right there beside you, and he bears the full force of the waves as he puts his arms around you and links onto you and links you onto him. And then the two of you are winched up out of the waves to safety, your relief as you get into that helicopter above. And then you see everyone rushing around the Coast Guard because he's lost his life so that you might have yours. Don't ever for a moment buy into ideas that because God judges, he is somehow unloving. You know, in the greatest love, God the Son left all the perfection and the joys of heaven in order to come down from heaven to earth to bear the full force of God's great anger at sin, to drown himself in the justice of God, shielding us from those waves so that we can be rescued and winched up to heaven.
Isn't that good news? That's what Easter's about. That's what we're celebrating in a couple of weeks. We sing it, and we'll sing it later on. Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ, I live. So Jesus' mission is one of judgment and salvation, isn't it? We can't just say it's one of salvation. It's both. Both the good news for this world. And what follows from that is that a sincere and sober response could not be more important. This series in chapter 11 and chapter 12 has been entitled Christ, a choice well made to try and bring home to us, as I think Jesus is trying to in this section of Luke, that it really, really matters that we respond rightly to Jesus. And as we finish the series today, we've got three particular things about that response in the rest of the passage that Jesus drives home. First, when we think about responding to this great Jesus, we need to appreciate the cost of what it's going to mean. You know, we've often said, Jesus doesn't do small print. He doesn't hide away uh, the T's and C's at the bottom of the page of that letter that you can't really read if you're my age. He doesn't put them in that long terms and conditions we now get online that no one ever reads, do they? Because they're just too long to look at. He puts them right at the top so that we realise what it's going to mean to commit to him. And so take a look from verse 51. Do you think I came to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but division. From now on, there'll be five in one family divided against each other, three against two, and two against three. Then he details various different family relationships. And yes, I know mother-in-laws are there, but it's not wholly the one that he stresses. Now, it can feel a bit odd, can't it? Verse 51, do you think I came to bring peace on earth? No. What well, isn't peace on earth exactly what we keep celebrating at Christmas? You know, don't the angels say to the shepherds, peace on earth? They do. So what's going on? Well, this peace, the angels say, is on those on whom God's favour rests. The peace is a peace found within the boundaries of the kingdom of God, isn't it? Where we're renewed into love. And graciousness one with another and because God's kingdom is not of this world that inevitably means division this side of heaven in fact division is mentioned three times in these couple of verses think if you can think Ukraine the Donbass region remember the eastern part of Ukraine now before Russian insurgents came in no doubt there would have been a degree of peace there as Ukrainians and Russians were living in the eastern Ukraine together. But as soon as insurgents and then Putin's armies come in, there are two kingdoms vying for people's allegiance, aren't there? And that inevitably brings division. Are you with the Ukraine or are you with Russia? Well, in the same way, when Jesus came as the true king of all, He's brought inevitably division. Are you with the kingdom of light or are you with the kingdom of darkness? Yes, it's peace, but it's not yet peace. Now it's choice. What's it going to be? The Satan or the Son? Self or the Savior? Foolishness or faith? Christians, devotion to Christ will mean division with others and Jesus wants us to be aware of that and I have to say isn't this one of the hardest things about being a Christian you know I can cope with all sorts of stuff but relational stuff is the most painful when a wedge is driven within families and friendships to feel you no longer belong with your biological family in the way you once did because you've put your trust in Jesus that can be so painful It's why being converted when married can be especially hard if your spouse doesn't follow uh, into the faith. 
Romans 12, 18 says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. That's our desire, isn't it? The hard thing is that others sometimes make peace impossible. I remember a guy I once read the Bible with, um, took a number of years to come to faith, and I, I kept asking, what is it? Why aren't you quite there yet? And it was always, oh, I'm just not sure, whatever. But in the end, he actually said that the reason is, I'm just worried about how my family are going to react. He didn't mean his wife. He meant his wider family. Now, he wasn't a Muslim where his family would conduct a funeral if he comes to faith in Christ, because that's often how serious it can be. He was just a Western Brit. But the pressure of the mocking from his family if he was to put his trust in Christ was so severe that it kept him back for years. So we need to be ready for when hostility comes, not let its pressure divert us from full allegiance to Christ, like that seed on stony ground. Remember how it withers because there's no water? The temptation to be less wholehearted so you don't face hostility from your family or friends, or so you don't feel isolated. Perhaps a, a temptation to change the gospel so you can think your loved one's going to be saved despite them not believing. It can be so hard. And can I speak to you briefly if you're not married? Wonderfully, some non-Christian spouses of Christians are wonderfully supportive uh, of their faith. But it, it's still very hard to really thrive uh, because the fact is that husband and wife are serving different kingdoms. So they have different priorities, which just makes it obviously quite difficult. But other non-Christian spouses can be very, very difficult. I remember someone who... Uh, uh, once came to church and they would say that every time they walked out the door to come to church their husband would mock them as they left that's hard isn't it but a christian spouse well they're called by christ to enable you to flourish in your faith to pour themselves out so that you can thrive for jesus and so jesus if you're not yet married would urge you to make sure that you go out with that you marry someone who's a committed christian you have the choice of doing that to do that because then you both belong to the same kingdom you see and you're not going to be in danger of being led away perhaps like solomon from his wives so the first thing jesus says is look given how important it is to respond to me appreciate the cost but second uh, follow the evidence he turns to the crowds now from verse 54 and so it's a word, I guess, for those particularly who perhaps aren't yet saying, I'm a follower of Jesus. And he has this illustration that can resonate with the British. It's all about predicting the weather. We're good at that. Uh, it, it, verse 54, the, the prediction of the blessing of rain, which it would have been in a hot country, may be pointing to salvation. The prediction of a hot wind, perhaps pointing to judgment. Uh, but the point is, is it's no good being able to predict the weather if you can't see the signs of Jesus having come and what they're pointing to. Look at verse 56. You know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and sky. How is it that you don't know how to interpret this present time? Why don't you judge for yourselves what is right? So Jesus would say to you, if you've not yet put your trust in him, kids, if you're not yet at a point of saying yes in my heart, I am committed to Jesus with my life and I'm going to seek his forgiveness when I do wrong, his help to do right. I'm going to play my part in his church. If you're not yet there at that, what he wants to say to you is follow the evidence. Think about predicting the weather. See where the things that Jesus did are pointing you. I haven't asked Esme if I can share this illustration. I'm sure you don't mind, darling. But we are coming home from school this week. Uh, commenting about the signs of spring the sun out it's just lovely and as we said um, it's brought her mixed feelings at one level she's really excited because it's telling her summer's coming at another level she's terrified because it's telling her her exams are coming as well and signs point to something don't they and Jesus is saying look the things that have accompanied his arrival are pointing to both salvation and judgment the joys and the terrors as well, you see. You know, we saw it earlier. Malachi said, a message is going to come before the Lord did. Well, John the Baptist arrived. So the Jew in Jesus' day should have been thinking, okay, well, the Lord himself is arriving. This is a time to get serious about his Messiah. 
Uh, and then you've got Jesus performing the miracles, which are the very things the Old Testament said would happen when God would arrive. Uh, and for us, we look back and we see his resurrection from the dead and we see the miracle of the church even coming to existence and then transforming the Roman Empire within 300 years. We see that just as Jesus said in AD 70, Jerusalem is destroyed. And all these things Jesus is saying is, look, they're pointers to what I'm saying, that I've arrived, that actually the end is almost here. In the Bible, the last days is not a term referring to a sort of short period at the, at the end of history. It's referring to the whole period between Jesus' first coming and his next. Because all the things surrounding his arrival are saying, it's almost here. The end of this present age has almost arrived. And we need to be ready for it. And so the third point in our response, we need to feel the urgency. Turning from a superficial and sentimental Christianity to a sober and a sincere one. And even if that causes others uh, to treat us badly, to, to separate from us in some way. Jesus wants us to prioritize above all else that we've responded rightly to him. And if you're not someone here who's yet a Christian or you're not sure if you are, um, well, this is a real word to you. And I hope you'll be encouraged to put your trust clearly in Jesus. Let's read from verse 58. As you are going with your adversary to the magistrate, try hard to be reconciled on the way, or your adversary may drag you off to the judge, and the judge turn you over to the officer, and the officer throw you into prison. I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. Remember Jesus, he doesn't hide away the difficult truth, he brings it up front. Now, the last verse, some might want to say, well, that's rather an encouragement. We Whatever the final punishment is, we get out of it in some way. Well, he's using parable-like language, and you can't square that with what he says elsewhere. It, actually, the emphasis here is that there is no end to it until uh, all justice is done. And elsewhere, he speaks of it being everlasting. But there is comfort in verse 58. The comfort is in that word beginning with an R. Reconcile. There's a chance for reconciliation with the one who we've wronged. Isn't that amazing? I showed a policeman illustration last week. I don't actually do it very often, but here's another one this week. Um, one of my funniest experiences was driving home, actually, from a, um, uh, was it? it was light, so probably an afternoon shift. And I hit some traffic, and the car behind me went straight into the back of the car and smashed up my, my car. And you know, I, I was a little bit angry about this because it was just bad driving. But when I got out of the car, it was just great to see their face, you know, as they got out because I was still in uniform. So the face just utterly dropped. Uh, I know what you'd usually expect is, well, it wasn't me. You know, you just break too quickly. You know, let's fight it out in the courts. It was, I'm really, really sorry. Uh, it was all my fault. Please, here's my details, you know, which you don't usually get when you've had uh, an accident. Uh, I was delighted. And by that, we were reconciled. You know, my anger passed, and I smiled, and I reassured him, and we dealt with it as best we were able. I think he paid me um, uh, independently. Now, it's like that with God, but even better. You know, just as he crashed into the very one who could see him prosecuted in court, uh, that's how we have been towards the Lord, isn't it? You know, none of us have an excuse. We owe the living God a debt the greatest possible debt of honor and love and obedience, a debt we can never ever pay because we've fallen so far short of it. But he is not a harsh adversary, our God. You know, he's not delighting in that saying, can't wait to get to court where we'll really see you suffer for what you've done. No, what he wants is he wants reconciliation. And where we come to him, sorry, pleading with him uh, to let us off our debts, to forgive us our sins, he's delighted to. And he says, look, don't worry, my son is the judge. 
Uh, and he's already committed to paying the debts uh, of anyone who seeks reconciliation with me for the wrongs they've done. Me. His perfect honoring of me, his perfect loving of me, his perfect obeying of me, that will be counted as yours and credited to your account, so don't worry. He satisfied my justice in his death and gifts to you his righteous standing before me. And I, the point from Jesus here is, well, now then is the time for getting right with God. You know, let's not leave it thinking, oh, well, on Judgment Day, I'm sure it will work out. Jesus is saying, no, it won't. Now is the time to make sure you're reconciled with the Father. Don't put it off. And note verse 58, can you see? Try hard, he says, to be reconciled. Put some effort in. Okay, so do you remember Barney Anderson, tall, redhead? Yeah, you remember Barney? Uh, he came back from university a few years ago, and he said to me, um, I said, how's it getting on? He said, fine. Um, and I'm listening to all the back catalogue of Grace Church's sermons. Okay, and I thought, oh, that's good, you know. I said, Barney, why are you doing that? And he said, well, to be honest with you, when I was in Salt, I didn't listen to a word you said. Um, and I realise now that I've missed out, uh, so now I'm going through the back catalogue, all right? So, kids, can I just say you're not the first ones, you know, to struggle with sermons. Uh, everyone who's gone before you has. But there was a humility in that, wasn't there, in Barney? But also a lesson, actually, that we really do need to listen. You know, if we don't listen, we really do miss out. And Jesus is saying, look, put every effort in to make sure you're reconciled to God. And that means try and listen to what you're taught at church and insult and from your parents, kids. And all of us, let's think hard about the gospel. Let's look in on our hearts and think, am I really committed to Jesus or aren't I? And let's make the effort to come to him in prayer and say, Please forgive me. Please change my heart so I'd be more for you. Uh, help me now to live this life you call it me to. Twice in the next paragraph in chapter 13, Jesus says, unless you repent, you too will perish. But wonderfully here, we're learning that if you do repent, you too will be reconciled. That's good news for us. Well, we're going to finish now uh, before we sing, but I just thought given this is all about response, it might be quite an opportune time to give an opportunity to respond. Uh, and this might be for you that you, you know that you haven't previously committed to Jesus and you know that you need to, and you've sensed a real urgency to that. It might be young people that you feel you've never wholeheartedly given yourself to Jesus. Well, I've got my uh, A, B, C and D here. So let me just ask you, and then we'll say a prayer. Look, do you accept that you are a sinner by nature who deserves God's judgment for the wrong you've done? You know, Christians, we accept that. Do you be, believe that Jesus rose from the dead, proving that he is God's son and king who died so you could be saved from this judgment and receive forgiveness and eternal life? You know, as Christians, that's what we believe. And will you... Therefore, call on Christ for the forgiveness and renewing life of his spirit that his death has made possible. Faith is shown by action, by calling on Jesus for that forgiveness. And will you then deny yourself your own desires to walk with him in obedience throughout your life, no matter what the response from others? Now, if you can say yes to that A, B, C, and D, that's what it is to be a Christian. And if you haven't said that before, Please just join in by saying this prayer in your heart and mind uh, with a big amen. Just have a look at them again. Have a read of those, kids, others. Can you say yes to these four things? And the second two. Well, it's such an important thing to ensure that we've properly committed to Jesus in this way. So let's all bow our heads. I'm going to read out a prayer that I'll then say, and uh, we can all say an amen to this, but if this is you for the first time, I really hope you'd come and tell me that afterwards. The prayer goes like this. Heavenly Father, I'm deeply sorry for how I have ignored and dishonored you in so many ways. I believe you sent your son to die and rise for my salvation. And so I commit my life to you now and turn away from sin. Please forgive me all I have ever done wrong 
and fill me with your spirit so that I can now live to please you and play my part amongst your people. Okay? So I'm going to say that slowly. And kids and adults, if this is you for the first time saying a proper yes, I'm really committed to Jesus, no matter what it takes, then say an amen in your heart. And the Lord hears it. And then do come and tell me afterwards. Heavenly Father, I am deeply sorry for how I have ignored and dishonoured you in so many ways. I believe you sent your son to die and rise for my salvation. And so I commit my life to you now and turn away from sin. Please forgive me all I have ever done wrong and fill me with your spirit so that I can now live to please you and play my part amongst your people. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Father, we pray for any here who have said that prayer with sincerity for the first time. But God, fill them now with your spirit, without whom we can do nothing that pleases you. Grant them by your spirit now all that they need to walk with you all their days and come in your good time to eternal life. Amen. And if you have said that for the first time, please do tell me afterwards. If you're feeling a bit embarrassed about telling me, uh, tell your mum or dad or someone else and they can tell me. But we'd love to be able to pray for you if you have. Well, our musicians are going to come up. We're going to respond by singing in Christ alone. Haven't sung that for ages, but it is a great song that reminds us that our only hope in life and death is Christ. So let's stand, shall we, and sing together.
together father god thank you so much for the opportunity to worship you uh, thank you for the opportunity to be reminded um, of the the glorious gospel that we have been saved from our sin uh, and brought into sonship to be brought into being your children um, help us to stand in that knowledge uh, both today and in the week to come uh, to live as people who are overjoyed by this truth <laughs> And uh, for those in this room who maybe said that prayer for the first time, um, we rejoice in that. And for those who are still on that journey, um, I pray that you will help them to consider that for themselves, um, that there is a joy unlike anything they have ever known in the person of Jesus. Now, with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen.